بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته MashaAllah, it's been uh, a few weeks uh, since we last met. Alhamdulillah, I pray that uh, your Ramadan or the latter half of your Ramadan, because I was here in the middle, middle half of Ramadan for, the, uh, for a, uh, a talk, but I pray that your Ramadan uh, went well and your Eid went well and may Allah Jalla wa'ala accept it uh, from us. And may He make us amongst those who, whose deeds and fasting and reciting Quran and standing up in night in prayer that he accepts the deeds because actually uh, more than anything else in the world it is Allah's qubool or acceptance which ultimately counts we are required to do the deeds but the deeds become pretty insignificant if they are not met with Allah's rida and qubool acceptance and divine pleasure and a Muslim is more concerned about divine acceptance Allah's acceptance of our deeds than the actual deed itself but because we're concerned about the deed uh, the acceptance we actually become concerned about how we perform the deed outwardly make it correct inwardly make it full of ikhlas and loving submission and then it's for Allah from his fadl his grace and his mercy that he accepts it it's noted from our salaf our pious predecessors particularly the sahab and the first and second generation of Muslims that they would yearn for the coming of Ramadan because of the month of Barakah and blessings and great reward and then no sooner had Ramadan uh, left them and said goodbye they were actually fervently praying to Allah Ya Allah for the next six months they were praying Ya Allah accept our fasting and our good deeds in the month of Ramadan and they were very keen that Allah would meet their deeds with their acceptance one of the tragedies uh, that happens to religious people especially in this day and age is that we think that well we've prayed and we fasted and we give zakat and charity that, uh, that, that I have a haq over Allah as, if, as it were I have a right over Allah that he should accept my de deeds even though the deeds that I do hardly meet, merit acceptance my focus is not on Allah outwardly I know very little of the Sharia so I don't even fulfill the outward conditions of prayer very well <coughs> inwardly there is not much of a prayer anyway because my mind <coughs> and my heart is all over the place and yet somehow because I'm religious I think that I have a right over Allah uh, a right that Allah accepts my deeds and this type of attitude or heart uh, is, uh, is one of the worst things it's an Iblisic heart it's a heart that is full of pride and not understanding that actually whatever we do to worship Allah we will never be able to worship Allah as he deserves and that recognition that whatever we do even if we were to do it for a thousand years whatever act of ibadah we do even if we were to do it continuously for a thousand years still we wouldn't worship Allah we couldn't worship Allah in the way that he deserves whatever we do we diminish the glory of Allah whatever we pray we diminish Allah's uh, uh, greatness and yet even with this diminishing Allah accepts our deeds even without knowing how to properly praise him even by not worshipping him as he should be worshipped by diminishing the greatness of God Allah still accepts our deeds SubhanAllah that's not because of us that's because of his great generosity and that Allah doesn't have that type of pride the pride of a human being that says oh look how old I am look how senior I am look what type of scholar I am look what type of uh, businessman I am you should come to me why should I go to you you should defer to me not me to you and if there was anyone 
that truly deserves deference, reverence, ta'zeem, respect and honor, truly without doubt, is Allah Jalla wa'ala. And yet we don't revere him as he should be revered. And we don't defer to him as we should defer to him. And yet he accepts our deeds. SubhanAllah. And that is just pondering over that. Uh, it causes the heart to become, inshallah, full of humility. Or at least increase in humility. That SubhanAllah, what do I offer to Allah? What really do I offer to Allah? And what does he give me back in return? Eternal paradise. Eternal joy and bliss. SubhanAllah. And it is... It is those type of lessons that we begin to learn in Ramadan. Because actually, fasting for 30 days and praying Taraweeh and other prayers for 30 days in a long English summer, in one sense, that's quite an achievement. On top of that, people might have been working and doing all other sorts of things. And one might think that's quite an achievement. And certainly it has required effort on our behalf. No one can say that the fasting was uh, so easy. We may say that actually fasting was easier than I anticipated. And the month of Ramadan went far quicker. It went swiftly, more, you know, quicker than I realized it would. No doubt. But no one could say the actual fast and the praying and then trying to balance between the suhoor and the iftar and the taraweeh and the work was easy in and of itself. So one might feel that we have accomplished, accomplished something. But when we hear the imam making dua, when we're reminded by other people, when they say, Rabbana taqabbal siyamana wa qiyamana wa tilawatana, Allah accept our fasting and our prayer and our recitation. Oh, oh Allah accept. Meaning that I don't know if it's been accepted or not. Even though I think I put in some serious effort. Then it begins to remind us actually that we are small creatures. We're not really worthy of even the, even the earth that we're made of. But Allah makes us worthy because of Iman and because of His generosity. And when we begin to have these understandings in our heart, then whether we're old or we're young, whether we're man or woman, whether we're scholar or non-scholar, Allah begins to put a type of barakah in our lives. And we begin to have, by His permission, a, a qadr, a standing with Him. Not because we deserve that standing, He gives us that standing. But if we don't have this thing, if we think that my deeds are worthy of, uh, they merit acceptance in and of themselves, absolutely not then that's Iblisic. That's Iblis thinking just because he prostrated in every place that there could be, you could possibly prostrate in the heavens and the earth, that somehow he, somehow he was beyond the law, above listening to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now he's ready to compete with the divine will when Allah says, make sajda to Adam. Well, Iblis works it out. Actually, I, I have reasons why I don't need to obey you, Allah. Because somehow I've, I've reached a, an equal understanding or a better understanding than you have. So the acts of, outward acts of worship, uh, the zahir acts of worship, didn't get him anywhere because inwardly there wasn't any true worship. Okay? And humility is the golden lesson. Humility. You know, I'm, I make an observation, I, not necessarily here, just generally. There was a time, I, I, I imagine, maybe it's just the way that I've been brought up. Obviously, I wasn't there. But in the old days, when you'd see most elderly men and women, by the time they're 60, 70, 80, if they live that long, and I can just think of my grandparents uh, on my father's side, because I never met my grandparents on my mother's side. They, they, they passed away even before I was born. But I remember my grandparents, very old, Rahimahullah. All that would come out of their mouth is du'as. Son, may Allah bless you and do this and may Allah give you khair and but And I found that the elder relatives that I experienced of that type of generation, once they got to a particular age, I don't know how they were in their youth, but once they got to a particular age, that's all that came. Dhikr of Allah, praises of Allah, and just good du'as for people. Even when there was something wrong going on, 
Allah has to forgive him. May Allah guide him. May Allah make him see sense. But it was only khayr. Now, <laughs> uh, you see elders of that rank and age. How can I get the new, new mobile phone? What, you know, what sky package can I... This is elders of 70, 60, 70 years old who should be saying something else. In their heart, there isn't that compassion. There's just nafrat. Or we say in Urdu, nafrat. Uh, hate, kind of a, a, a despising. Because they've got a chip on their shoulder. And I think, you know, subhanAllah, uh, a lot of that is to do with we haven't understood who we are in front of Allah. So from that tragic tale <laughs> uh, to another uh, kind of like tragic tale, uh, uh, if you've noticed uh, Dr. Salim and uh, the organizers of the masjid sent out the title of today's talk, which was Patience, uh, Antidote to Life Sufferings, or as Shakespeare once put it, Patience and the Pelting of a Pitiless Storm. All right, okay. Because actually the world throws storms at us that we don't expect. Okay, and in, we don't expect as human beings, but as believers, we have been given teachings that these things will happen. So, for example, if I, uh, if I turn to uh, the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ and we shall surely test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and loss of lives and fruits. But glad tidings are for the sabirun, are for the patient people. Those who, when afflicted with any calamity, قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They say to Allah we belong, and to Him shall we return. Upon those is the mercy of Allah, upon those is the salawat, is the blessings of Allah and His mercy. They are the rightly guided. So this verse is already telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it as part of the human drama, as part of the human experience, that we will be tested with loss of things which are near and dear to us. And losing near and dear ones in the form of people that we love, in the form of uh, a business that we have invested a lot, lot of time and effort in, in the form of property and money that we had acquired, even in the form of a reputation that I kind of worked to gain in the public eye. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, uh, yet, and other things besides that people hold dear and valuable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that part of the human experience is that you will most certainly be tested with loss of those things. Including loss of near and dear and beloved ones. وَبَشِّرُ sabirin. But give glad news, glad tidings to those who are patient, who have sabr. Who are those? They are those who إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They are those who, when they are afflicted with a, a trial or a calamity, a tribulation, an adversity, they say, immediately they record the reality, the haqiqa. And what is this haqiqa or reality? إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ To Allah we belong. And to Him shall we return. Upon them is the salawat of Allah and His rahmah. Blessings and mercy, and they are rightly guided, the muhtadun. Inna lillahi reminds us, wa inna ilayhi raji'un reminds us something very significant in all of this. 
that everything that we have that we love and that is good and that we value all of these are gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on loan to us for a specific term or time. My parents are on loan to me. Or the other way around, I'm on loan to my parents. And either they or I will be taken to Allah, but we know that they will be parting. My children are on loan from me to Allah and there comes a time of parting. My best friends are on loan to me from Allah and there will most surely be a day of parting. And the parting hurts. The loss of those whom we love, it strikes at the soul. The pain oftentimes is unbearable. One feels that their world is shattered into pieces. Even for a moment, sometimes even the best of the believers, the puzzle doesn't make sense. The equation doesn't balance. What's going on? But Allah tells us in this inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon that, oh my servants, everything you have that is good and that you love is on loan, is a gift from me to you. And it is on loan from me to you with this shart or condition that you accept the decree that I will unfold for you with this particular gift. Accept my decree and my wisdom that I give you alone for a specific time. And once that time expires, once the expiry date is met, I've already told you in advance, I will take back that loan. And I don't say don't be hurt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not chiding us and He will not scold us and he will not certainly punish us for feeling emotionally hurt. But it does not befit a believer to complain against Allah. Why? How dare you? Those words don't issue, uh, issue forth from the believer. Rather the believer says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un even if tears are from it flowing from his or her eyes and the heart is bleeding we belong to Allah to him shall we return and only when we begin to understand this meaning that the meaning of loss is explained to us by Allah. The meaning of loss is not that there will be a permanent loss because good things always go back to Allah and good things are good people are always with Allah in Jannah. We just have to ensure on this earth we are we we are favored by Allah and accepted by him. Uh, before Ramadan uh, I think in Ramadan and also uh, a month or two before Ramadan, I think maybe four or five months before Ramadan, I mentioned to you a case of a young girl, she was 10 at that time when I mentioned it here, uh, of Fiza, a young girl who contracted uh, blood cancer, leukemia. And she was in a very dire state for a, a, a year or so. It was very touch and go. And uh, she suffered uh, through chemotherapy as they normally do. Uh, various treatments of cancer that involve chemo, then it's, it can be very painful. And the girl is only 10, was only 10. And in Ramadan, uh, actually on the day of Eid, or the, the day before Eid, the doctors felt that she had made a sufficient enough recovery to actually leave uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital and actually spend Eid uh, with her parents. That's how 
uh, happy they were with her slow recovery after a touch and go year. But she went into a relapse towards the end of the Eid day with her parents. She, and she went back to her illness. And it was a relapse that she never recovered from. And shortly after, the day after, uh, Allah took her to himself early morning. And the janazah was done in this great locality uh, late afternoon. And she was 11. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, he uh, grant, even though she's a child, nevertheless we'll say Allah grant her forgiveness and grant her jannah. And we hope that she is included amongst those because she was a Muslim child that the Prophet said Muslim children, children enter paradise they just go straight to paradise and we pray that she is also from those who is, grant, is granted the permission for Shafa to intercede on behalf of her family, her parents, her relatives and her near and dear ones so even if they don't quite make the mark the people who make Shafa which is the, uh, the Shafa which is the Aqeel of Ahl Sunnah that anyone who has a qadr standing with Allah from the prophets and the messengers and from the siddiqun and the awliya and from even the normal lay people who are from Allah accepts them to be from the salihun that he gives them the right of shafa intercession and the Muslim children have intercession and if the Muslim parents don't quite make the mark Allah gives Muslim children the front row seats you know, if we were uh, leave Islam for a minute, a minute, supposing we were just uh, very important people, supposing I was a very important person in society, uh, a cele God forbid, a celebrity or a, a film star or a pop star, or I've just kind of won the, 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 the new rounds of X Factor. God help us. <laughs> okay. Uh, so wherever I go, and let's say that I'm so publicly known, wherever I go, I'll be treated like royalty. And if I were to go to uh, buy some tickets at the opera, all right, okay, and then the guy who runs the opera house, he says, oh, Abu Alia, you know, gangster movie star, okay, he will give me front row ticket, tickets because that's the nature of having a station with someone. And if I just bring along my friend, just, you know, my friends are nobody, but he's my friend. And I go to the opera house. Okay, don't try this out. And I go to the opera house with him. And uh, I say, oh, well, you know, it's just my friend. He's just with me for the day. They'll say, no problem. They'll give him front row sick tickets. They'll give him front row tickets, not because of him, because of me. SubhanAllah. Then we can only imagine if Allah gives children of the, Mus the Muslim children who died at a young age front row tickets, and even as if we as parents don't quite make it and the child says, Ya Allah, you allowed me to go into the best part of Jannah but I don't really want to go in until I go in with my man dad. If that's the case with the, the owner of an opera house or anything else, a good restaurant that he's going to be generous enough to say, yeah, well, look, you know, it, that's your friend, someone you like. Give him the best seat in the house. Then what about Allah Kareem, the generous Lord? that the children who he's given this grace to inshallah he'll say go in with your parents they too have the best row, best seat in the house subhanallah these are not this is not freudian freud at the in, you know in the in the beginning of the 20th century psycho, psychoanalyst analyst says the reason why human beings invented god it's for a comfort factor you know, we suffer, we suffer loss and tragedy and calamity and, and, and. And there is something within the genetic makeup of human beings that uh, long time ago in the hunter-gatherer days or even before that of our ancient, ancient ancestors that we psychologically programmed ourselves to kind of invent this mythical God in the sky so that will be a comfort to us, a big fatherly figure so that we can say, yes, well, you know what? Now that we've lost something on earth, there is father in the sky. Absolutely not. It's a reality. Allah telling us that there is meaning to loss and Allah will reward the patient people untold amounts. This is not Allah trying to just give us some psychological comfort. 
a nice little fairy story, you know, in the English Western tradition, you lose your tooth as a little child and it hurts a lot, especially if the dad has to yank out the tooth as he's dangling, okay, in the old days before you took them to a dentist, okay, and then you have to somehow kind of like, how do you kind of compensate the balance, so you say, actually put your tooth under... Uh, under your pillow and the tooth fairy will come along and you get a shilling all right don't worry about what a shilling is like a thruppence or three p or whatever and in the morning you think yeah that's cool you know so the, the pain it was kind of it was offset it it was worth the small pain and the cry at night again don't try that at home you know, you'll be really upset to know there aren't tooth fairies there are there are angels and maybe not tooth fairies but i'm sure there are angels that are worried about our teeth as well but it's not a comfort. Uh, it's not a comfort factor. It's a reality. It brings comfort, but it's a reality. That's what I'm trying to say. And sabr is not something that happens later. It ha As the Prophet said, sabr is meant to happen at the onset of the tragedy. We hear a tragedy. Not a tragedy far away because those are easier to cope with. Wallahi, if you say to me, a Muslim died in Timbuktu, inshallah I'll say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. But the reality is it won't cut me so deep. Of course we are meant to be one ummah and our hearts are meant to bleed out. But the reality is it doesn't, you know, apart from a few of Allah's dear and close ones, awliya, most people don't have that intensity of feeling that can extend over across the other side of the world in the same intensity as it can extend with someone you know. And Allah doesn't require that from us as well. And actually until recently, the world wasn't engineered such that we had to feel so much for someone across the world because we wouldn't know much about them. But we were meant to feel for someone right in our, on our doorstep and actually do something about it. Actually, just as an observation, the world, including the Muslims, we kind of slightly changed the, the rules a bit. Now we feel for so many people around us, uh, 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 so many people across the world, now we feel for, quite rightly, Burma and Syria and Chad and this, and mashallah, but we do very little for people who are directly in front of us. The Sunnah tells us, Whatever happens, whatever else you do, do something directly for the people in front of you. With your zakah, with your sadaqah, with, with your khidmah. That is to say, Allah is not interested in merely us feeling hurt for everyone around the world. But He wants us to do something immediate. Now if we do something immediate and feel for others around the world, that's even better. That shows even more iman. But if we're feeling around the world, oh, stuff, look at this, it's a tragedy, Syria is a tragedy, but what happened? Two pounds fifty went out of my pocket, yeah? And maybe one dua somewhere in Ramadan I got for Syria. Syria? I can't remember, what, what's, what's Syria about? Burma. Oh yes, of course, we didn't like some of the pictures on flying around the, uh, the, the net. But how many duas and how much I did? Yeah, I got a dua in somewhere for them, I think. And at the same time, because I did that, I feel, mashallah, I've done my job for the ummah. And I've done nothing here as well. That's not how the world worked, or is meant to work. But loss. Let's go back to loss and finish. We can't avoid loss. The Prophet said, love who you will and love them dearly. For one day you will part. And the parting hurts. And Islam doesn't forbid emotion. The same Allah who took the one whom we loved is the same Allah who gave us those emotions. And the authentic hadith records that on one particular occasion they came to the Prophet wasallam. And they said, Ya Rasulullah alayhi salatu salam, your infant son Ibrahim, he's dying. And he, Salah Asim, went back home. And he saw Ibrahim lying there. And he picked baby Ibrahim up in his arms and held him. And he saw how Ibrahim was gasping for air, struggling. 
and the rhythm of breathing was coursing out of him and life was coursing out of him at that time and as he watched his infant son dying in his arms tears rolled down the cheeks of the Prophet and one of the people with him one of his Sahaba were was surprised that the Prophet is weeping or crying and he indicated that Ya Rasulullah even you meaning even you you cry because what had happened before is that the Prophet had said in the presence of this man that Allah curses those who wail niyaha wailing wailing is when when for example someone passed away and i'm just going to do this as a just you know just as a, an example not as a rule thing but you know you say ah, like that and it's half of it is real and half of it is exaggerated because you just have to go with the flow that's called wailing but sobbing when you weep and maybe women weep louder than men maybe i don't know okay but men tend to weep in a more restrained way most of the time Weeping, sobbing, making some noise when you're crying, which is just natural within limits, is one thing. Wailing, there's a nahi, there's, there, there's a prohibition on this. And so this man got confused. He's confused that the prohibition of wailing applies to weeping and crying. And yet here, he saw some is weeping and crying. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, not even at you as well. And the Prophet corrected him. Hadhi rahmah. This is mercy. This, these tears, they're mercy. And then he regained his breath after he gained his composure because infant Ibrahim had passed away. He said, the eye sheds tears and the heart grieves. But we do not say anything to displease our Lord. Oh, Ibrahim, we weep because of being parted from you. Oh Ibrahim, we weep because of being parted from you. Allah takes something away from us, but He throws into our hearts God-given emotions. And there's no problem there. That's okay. What is not okay is that we take those emotions and take them past its boundaries and begin to have a philosophy of despair, a philosophy of suffering, a philosophy of complaining against Allah. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? This is unjust. Kada wa kada, so on and so forth. This type of thing must not cannot come from a believing mouth no matter what pain and tragedy we experience we must always recall my brothers and sisters and elders that if darkness has struck my life the sun is still out there shining on the world if frost is what I feel and the warmth has gone in my life Warmth is still out there in the world. If my affairs seem to have been turned upside down and topsy-turvy and nothing is making sense. But the world is still running to a clear-cut plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never mistake our personal tragedies with an overall philosophy that everything has gone wrong and nothing is right. Inna lil inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And so Allah gives certain people time to grieve. Three formal days of grieving. A month of grieving, maybe for uh, a woman who's lost her husband. A month and a, and a bit. Formal grieving. That doesn't mean that three days you have to somehow go to a psychologist and look get all the grief out of you but three four more days of grieving why because no doubt those who passed away have a huck upon us a right upon us that we remember them 
and oftentimes we remember them in a type of sorrow. Even if their lives gave us joy and happiness, but their absence in our lives now is a sorrow. The, the, the dead have a right over us living. And so there are three days perhaps of formal grieving. But the living, the remainder of my family and my friends near and dear ones, they too have a right over me. They also have a right over me that sooner or later they see a smile from me. Sooner or later they see the glimmers of hope in my eyes. They see the frost melt away from my soul to be irradiated by the mercy and the healing of heaven. The living have a lot to do. And the living keep their connection with the dead through fond memories. Through remembering, the, mentioning them to the living in a good way. For make, for make, with making to our for, for, from, as according to the majority of Sunni Islam, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, of Isal or Thawab, giving charity on their behalf, reciting Quran such that the reward re uh, reaches them, Ma sending salawat such that the reward re reaches them. Isal or Thawab. To now and again uh, respectfully visiting their graves and the graves of other believers. For remembering them specifically in our du'as. We always have a connection. But life, not to sound too cheap, has to go on. And in some cases, it's a case that not just natural death of a disease, but it could be a violent death. Some criminal or person who is not a criminal but acted criminally took the life of someone close to me. Then we are told, and human experience tells us, there will be seven stages of grief. The first stage will probably be shock and bewilderment. How could that happen? How could anyone do such a thing? The second stage will probably be a level of intense despair. I just can't think straight. Nothing makes sense. The curtain has gone over the light. The third stage will maybe a sense of anger and resentment against the perpetrator and even anyone who is related to him. It can happen. It does happen. And though the Sharia does not condone that, it doesn't commend that. It doesn't encourage that. It does for a short time overlook it. It does for a short time overlook it. But if it is a criminal who deserves justice, then the law must do its thing. And through the fulfillment of law and qisas, retribution, it is hope that the family will find healing. But if it is a mistake, if it was unintentional, even if the retribution khisas is there and the law is there, there shouldn't, there sh ideally shouldn't be that anger or resentment against the, pe the person and certainly not against the family. It is easier for me to say this sitting here than to do it if I was in that situation. Nevertheless, that is the greater meaning of Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilayhi Raji'un. It is that we don't step over the bounds in our hurt and anger, and that we find healing. And every human being knows at a certain age, hate very seldom brings healing, love and forgiveness bring healing. Love and forgiveness brings healing. And that's why we have this janaza prayer. A way of closure. A way of the Muslim community coming together to show their support. To shed their tears as well. To 
offer their condolences to make dua if 40 people of Tawheed make dua for a Muslim who's passed away then wajabatul jannah jannah is obligatory for that person who has been prayed over as the Prophet says in the authentic hadith and so the more the merrier at least for the janazah if not for the burial but then at least for the janazah but we need more for the janazah because sometimes it takes a lot of time to dig today we have um, diggers but they are kind of, you know, they kind of, I don't know, I don't know. it's not a Sharia thing, it's just a, a reflection. Diggers tend to do the job very well, but it's supposed to be the human touch. I, I, I wonder, should it not be the human touch? And I wonder, doesn't the rumbling disturb, disturb the, 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 the sleeping of the dead? The world may be mechanic, mechanical and technological, but we Muslims don't have to just follow suit blindly. Okay, the human touch. It's the earth that I pick up and I put in my hands and three earth falls I put in the, in the grave as part of the prophetic sunnah. It's me that is lowered into the niche of the grave with maybe another person or whoever of the relatives and we're physically fixing the grave to face Qibla. We're doing this all because it's the human touch. Just like the Adhan, don't ring the bell. Don't have a chiming bell. Just have the human touch. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. So I'm wondering, shouldn't the human touch be continued? Allah Akbar. It takes longer. And that's why more of us need to be there. Tragedy. 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 Truth be told, uh, the last week, uh, two weeks, uh, since I've been doing this as a, two khutbahs, and uh, actually from Ramadan up until now, there have been two or three very tragic incidences that have happened uh, within the community which have affected me uh, and others personally. So actually, the, 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 I actually feel like I've gone through a spin dryer and everything, you know, my emotions have almost be, been kind of rinsed clean. Uh, which in one sense I'm glad because uh, without, now that I'm not very emotional, I hope that I'm saying more practical things. Uh, to make us understand how to deal with calamity. If you go to thehumbleeye.com, thehumbleeye, H-U-M-B-L-E, dot com, dot com, I, with the letter I, humbleeye.com, or thehumbleeye.com, that's a new blog I started just in the end of Ramadan, and uh, the recent posting on there is about patience, uh, and there are other bits and pieces on there about marriage and about spirituality and about Muslims in this society, so on and so forth. So please do mention, uh, visit thehumbleeye.com and leave your comments as well, inshallah ta'ala. So part of this is on there. Next week, I'm going to put the whole of this talk that I haven't done on there. Uh, and I, 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 I'm sure that you'll like the, the, the talk better than I kind of uh, delivered it. The only thing I'd like to say, one more thing is this. Uh, it's important that we realize that we're not the only ones that are suffering. All over the world, suffering is happening. Allah doesn't really want, need for us to understand why things happen. We are quite happy to leave it to Allah's greater wisdom, why He took this life and why not that life. Why did it happen in this way and not that way? Why was it so violent or tragic there and so calm and peaceful there? We're content to leave the whys and the wares to a greater wisdom that we trust. But more than understanding why, Allah just wants a response from us. Allah wants to see, do we respond to tragedy and calamity as Muslims, as believers, having a trust in Allah's will and Allah's plan? Allah wants from us at all times adab manners, good behavior, proper conduct. If we weep, alhamdulillah, but no wailing. If we have resentment for a little while because it's a very nasty situation, no problem. But don't build upon that resentment to make it an issue of hating with, without Allah's permission, without Sharia justification. And know that through forgiveness and mercy and turning to Allah, the heart is healed far, far quicker. And we remember the dead. Children, we remember, children remember their parents, especially the parents who taught them good, good Islam by living out our Islam because the parents still get the reward of that. We remember our children just by living life with our other existing children. 
and with the hope that if I fall short for some reason, I'm really hoping that I'll get front row seats with my children. In all of this, the Sunnah of Al Mustafa Sallallahu teaches us Adab. Women, I, I, don't, I, I suspect there aren't many here, perhaps none here. You are the fragile vessels. Allah has allowed you to be more emotional. But Adab, still Adab. And when we gather at the house of any family who is weeping, yes, we may offer condolences. We may ask, how did it happen? But don't get into too much chit chat. That is the time then to make dua. How many gatherings of deceased people you go around and they're just chit chatting? The men are outside, one is smoking away. Okay, so maybe he's a bit nervous and whatever, and you need to light a fag, leaving the Sharia ruling on smoking. And the one is on the phone, and the one is this, and the one is saying, Oh, do you know where I can get a cheap iPhone from? Is this the nature of Muslim men? Don't Muslim men know that they go into the room, they offer their condolences, they sit down, they make dua, they make dhikr, they recite some portion of the Qur'an if it's part of gifting it to the dead, Isa al thawab They sit down and contemplate death. What have I done to prepare? Am I still skanking the DHS system with haram claims? Have I still got haram going on in my house? Are there pictures of naked people in my house? Are, are there pictures up in my house that the angels don't enter into? This is the way of a man. Believe you me, Allah never made a man, someone who has genital organs between his legs. And, and maybe he has a physique. That's not man in Islam. Man in Islam is Rijal or a Rajul who has Ikhlas and Iman. And he's obedient to the Sunnah of Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he falls short, he makes Tawbah. And when he confronts death, he remembers how much he has prepared and how much he hasn't prepared. Nothing else is man. Nothing else is Rajul. Rijal. Rajul isn't that you have what you wear something and you show your button and you show your chest and you show your Audhu Billah. Donkeys can do that. Isn't that right? Donkeys and animals can do that. Some of them better than others. But Allah gave the mu'min something to contemplate, <coughs> Iman, to stir, to drive him to Amal al Salih. To make him think about Allah Jalla. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He grant us patience. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us people of inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajun. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He make us understand the rights that are upon us, the conduct of a believer. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He removes our jahala because we have ignorance in us. That He removes our jahala and gives us ilm. That He removes us our jahala and He gives us amal salih. That he removes our jahala and that he gives us ilm and yaqeen. That he removes us jahala and makes us amongst the Muslimun. Too many of us were in jahala. We're in jahiliyyah, our personal ignorances. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enlighten us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us. We ask Allah jalla wa ala to forgive us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mashfi mardana warham mawtana. Rabbana dhalamna anfusina wa ilam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al-khasirin. Rabbana aatina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirti hasana wa qina adhabanna. Rabbana la tuzi qulubana baada il hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma. Innaka anta al-wahab. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala.